This video is a review for Dragon's Dogma 2. I received my copy of the game early from Capcom, and at this point I've completed the game and most of the content. This review is going to be spoiler-free, it will not discuss story-related content, it will not show monsters on the screen that you haven't seen already in promotional material, and the section regarding story in this review will talk about the story in a vague way, and will use the story of Dragon's Dogma 1 as a baseline for comparison. So let's jump in. First of all, if you're a fan of Dragon's Dogma 1, and you're excited about Dragon's Dogma 2, you don't need this review. This game is exactly what it appears to be, and it's what many fans of Dragon's Dogma 1 have wanted. It's Dragon's Dogma 1, but more of it. More polished, nicer graphics, but ultimately very similar in spirit. The graphics may be nicer, but the art style is basically exactly the same. Combat has the same focus of figuring out how to deal with each new monster you encounter, and how to use your very individual vocation to best effect against these new monsters. They've doubled down on the complexity of the quests and their willingness to let you fail them or complete them in a suboptimal way. In a way, this doesn't feel like Dragon's Dogma 2, because you can tell that the game doesn't have a focus on innovating that much from the first one. It's not trying to innovate, it's trying to better utilize the concepts it introduced in Dragon's Dogma 1. And I think this is true for basically all levels of the game. The pawn system, the combat, the climbing on monsters, the unforgiving quests, the limited fast travel. It's trying to be a better version than its original title. And for the most part, it succeeds. Although, just to get this nitpick out of the way, one way it doesn't succeed is in the intro song. The original Dragon's Dogma had a much beloved Japanese rock song on the title screen. Much to my dismay, it was removed with the release of the Dark Arisen DLC. But for the most part that was fine because the song in the DLC was also very good. And perhaps also more appropriate. But the song in Dragon's Dogma 2's title screen, this, this is no good. This is just sad. An immense disappointment. On its own, the music is nice enough, but its predecessors left big shoes to fill and this song has tiny, tiny feet. Alright, the highlight of combat in Dragon's Dogma is the interactivity of the big monsters. A great example is the Chimera. The Chimera has three parts, the lion head, the goat head atop it, and the snake head that serves as a tail. Each one of these heads can move independently and will attack you in different ways. The lion will use powerful physical attacks. The goat head above it is harder to reach and will spend its time casting spells. The snake head spews out poison and will try to interfere with you if you're climbing the chimera. Each one of these heads have an independent health pool and once depleted, that head will die and no longer use some of its signature attacks. One of the things that people like about Dragon's Dogma is how complex these monsters can be and can be interfered with in different ways. For example, you could silence the goat head, preventing it from casting magic. You can set fire to a griffin's wings, preventing it from flying or force it to the ground if it was flying. And the different vocations can be so distinct from one another that they approach battling monsters in different ways. For example, a fighter or warrior class can spend a lot of their time on the monster's legs, trying to knock it down and get better access to their weak point. They could try climbing on the monster, but unless they're at an elevated position or the monster's head is low to the ground, you could be spending a lot of time getting from the bottom to the top. Thieves, on the other hand, are nimbler. They can climb on monsters more easily. They have the agility and the moves to let them reach monster weak points more quickly without necessarily waiting for a big opening or when they're toppled. The archer can also hit enemy weak points from the ground, which lets them consistently do big damage throughout the battle. And they also get access to tarred and drenched arrows, which opens up monsters to further combinations. Normally, if you hit an enemy with enough fired attacks, it will catch fire doing some damage over time. But if you tar the enemy beforehand or during the time that it's on fire, it will have the torch status effect, which does much more damage over time. If a monster is drenched, you can hit it with cold damage, which will freeze it for a few seconds. Or you can hit a drenched enemy with thunder damage, which will cause the thunder to arc further away into other enemies and cause the benumbed status effect. And all of these effects also work on you. In Dragon's Dogma 1, you could get flasks and fill them with oil and then use those to throw at monsters to tar them. But in Dragon's Dogma 2, you can't do that, that you can't throw items at enemies anymore. 
In the first game, you could really exploit the effects that some of these items had. And it seems in the second one, they want to limit the power and the ease of interactions like that. Each vocation has four different skills that it can equip. You unlock more active and passive skills as that vocation levels up. Skills don't have a cooldown, they have a stamina cost. So you can use them over and over so long as you have the stamina. But you have to watch that stamina because you might see a monster about to do a big attack and you want to use that stamina to run away. Or if you're a fighter, you might want to use it to block. Then your character will be out of breath and will spend a significant amount of time trying to recover. The amount of time you spend in that state can be reduced if a pawn notices and comes up to you and helps. One thing that might put people off about the combat is that there's no lock-on and there's no dodge roll. Some attacks will automatically target enemies, but for the most part, if you want to attack something, you're going to have to face it and just attack. And there is a dodge roll, but it's exclusive to the thief class. And every class is going to have to have its own solution to avoid damage. The fighter can block and parry with the shield. The warrior can use its various skills to mitigate and tank through damage without getting stunned. And a lot of classes have some kind of counter move. But some classes, like the mage, don't have anything like that. There's no move that they have access to that's just going to let them get away from damage or reduce it. For them, optimally, they're far enough away that they're not at huge risk. But other than that, they're just going to have to get out of the way. Overall, combat is very good, but I have a couple of big complaints. First of all, there's a surprisingly low number of big monsters. This is especially true in the early game I explored around quite a bit and did as many side quests as I could find. But even still, for almost 15 hours, the only things I had seen, big monster-wise, were Cyclops, Ogres, and the occasional Minotaur. Compared to the first game, they didn't add that many new monster types. The ones that they did add, the ones that were new, were very cool, but also tended to be more rare. And creatures like the ones that you've seen in the promotional material, the really interesting looking new ones, like the Dullahan and the Medusa, those I fought exactly one time each. And this is with me having 81 hours in the game and going out of my way trying to find more. Now there are some very interesting ones in the endgame, but you're not going to spend most of your playtime in the endgame. You're going to spend it in the early and mid game, and during your time in the early stages you're just going to pray to see a chimera because you're sick of seeing so many cyclops and ogres. Another problem with the combat is that it becomes too easy too quickly. Fighting each new monster is engaging and fun, at least the first few times, but I don't think that the monsters scale, and if they do scale, they scale poorly. To the point that in early mid-game, I would say, if you've done side quests and explored around, you'll notice that you're starting to go through the monsters very quickly, and once you notice that, it doesn't stop. In fact, the steamroll just continues to pick up speed, and it can get to a point where you are fighting a new monster that you've never seen, and the fight goes so quickly that you didn't have time to even learn or understand the mechanics that the monster was supposed to be using, which in my opinion diminishes a big aspect of the game. In Dragon's Dogma 1, if you wanted to mitigate this issue, you could choose to play in hard mode. Sadly, in the sequel, that doesn't seem to be an option anymore. My complaint isn't that the game is too easy exactly, because it certainly wasn't too easy at the beginning, and it's only natural that the game become easier as you grow to understand it. My problem was that the rate of growth to getting to that point was much too fast, and some of the more interesting, challenging monsters that appear towards the endgame are rare and don't appear in normal common areas even after you've gotten a lot of levels. Which means you'll be fighting a lot of the same enemy types that you've been fighting, that you've basically mastered, with much better equipment and stats than you faced them your first time. Alright, moving on, let's talk about pawns. Early in the game, you'll make your main pawn. And this pawn is yours, you choose its vocation, you choose its skills, you buy its equipment. But your other two pawns you'll have to get from the Rift, which is just essentially the internet. The other two pawns you will bring will be the main pawns of other Arisen. And they will use the skills, equipment, and inclinations that they had for their own master. It's a very cool system. One of my favorite things about it is that as you're going through the game, you might find a pawn that you like. But these other pawns don't level up, so you'll have to replace them every so often. The interesting thing is that sometimes you'll find a pawn that is consistently at your own level. 
And that's happening because the person is leveling up at approximately the same rate. So every time you dismiss a pawn, you can send them off with a little item and give them a rating. And then once sent off, you could try and look for that pawn again and see if it has also gotten into a higher level in the meantime. It's a really interesting feeling going through the game at the same pace as a friend of yours is or some other random pawn that you've grown fond of. And the pawns will learn. They have knowledge about enemy weaknesses that they'll learn in other people's worlds and bring back to your own game. And they'll even have knowledge about how quests are completed from having done those quests in somebody else's world, which can help guide you to an optimal result. But we'll talk about quests in a minute. First, I want to talk about some of the things that people might find vexing about Dragon's Dogma. Because it has a lot of design elements that I'm sure many people will find annoying. So people that are on the fence should pay special attention to this part. Because I feel a lot of these could be deal breakers for people. First of all, the game has a fairly large world and a limited fast travel system. There are port crystals in certain locations and you can use a fairy stone to travel to those locations. You can also find port crystals around the world, and once you have them, place them where you like, creating a new fast travel point. However, there's not that many places that have port crystals, and port crystals themselves as an item are fairly rare. As for fairy stones themselves, you can find them very rarely, and they'll be at shops for 10,000 gold, which is a lot, especially at low levels. Plus, shops will usually only have one of them. Towards the end of the game, when you have tons of money, this won't be so much of a problem. You would be buying fairy stones all the time. But early on, and even throughout most of the mid-game, you're not going to be able to afford those fairy stones, and if you do afford them, you're going to use them sparingly. Which means that if you need to go somewhere, for the most part, you're going to walk. There are also ox cart carriages that you can take to places that will let you fast travel. But those are only available to certain towns, and they will only take you to certain other towns. Those ox carts can also be ambushed in the road, and in the ensuing battle, the ox cart might get destroyed, leaving you stranded somewhere along the path, sometimes at night. When you have a bunch of quests that you want to do, you want to load up on them, and then you need to see where exactly the location you're supposed to go is on those quests. And so when you set out in that direction, your plan is to like do all of the stuff at once. And then if you do have a fairy stone, you maybe use that to get back. The ox cart isn't going to take you directly there. You'll use these carriages as a way to get close to the location and then walk the rest of the way. You're going to be walking a lot in this game, for long periods of time. It'll be less impactful as you level up and get money and are able to use the fast travel system more often, but at first it's going to, you're going to walk. You're going to walk to those places, and you're going to spend many, many minutes along the way. Along with that, the game has a resting mechanic. When you take damage, your total health is slowly reduced. As you're traveling or exploring caves or doing side quests, the total amount of your health is going to keep getting lower from all the damage that you're taking. You can't heal this with items. There's no item in the game that's going to let you get your maximum health back. In order to do that, you need to rest, either by sleeping at an inn or sleeping in a campsite. There are various campgrounds around the world, but in order to use them, you'll need to have a camping kit. And all of this together can be annoying if you don't enjoy this kind of thing. Let me paint you a picture. There was one time where I went off to do a quest, but I didn't pay attention to the time of day when I left, so I got caught at night. At night, ghosts spawn, which are more difficult to kill than normal goblins, and are easier to deal with with magic, which at the time I didn't have a pawn that had any magic. These two bad decisions led me to just try and run away from the ghosts, which got me ambushed by a minotaur and a bunch of goblins. The minotaur was stronger than I was at that time. It killed my pawns very quickly, and the damage I was taking convinced me to not linger. So I run away from the minotaur, and I abandon my two dead pawns. It's just me and the main pawn now. I manage to get away, and I find a camping area. Counting my blessings, I go over to the camp so I can recover my lost health and change it to daytime, but I can't because one of the pawns that I left behind was carrying the camping kit, which means that when he died, it got teleported to my storage, which meant I had no way of either changing it to the more tolerable daytime or getting back at the maximum health I had lost. 
At this point, I was too close to my destination to go back, and I already knew there was a lot of angry things behind me. So I decide to press forward. I'm constantly getting ambushed by goblins and other minor threats. They're not too bad, but the damage that they're doing to me is continuously lowering my health, making my death more and more likely. I'm down to about 25% health when I find a riftstone out in the wild, which I touch and use it to summon two new pawns, one of which was specialized in magic to deal with ghosts at night. And now that I had a full party, I made my way to the town that I was heading to. And right before I got to it, a griffin came down and killed me. It was fantastic. If that story doesn't appeal to you, then it's very likely that much of this game won't either. Also, the game only has one save slot. It'll auto-save sometimes, but you can choose to manually save it. And when you're loading in, you can either load in your most recent save or the last time you slept at an inn, which makes save scumming much more difficult and more costly to do. Interestingly, though, you can't start over. And this one surprised even me. There doesn't seem to be an option on the title screen or in the settings to start from the beginning. There's no option to delete your save data. It's very odd. There is an option when you clear the game to go into New Game Plus. But even that is odd because you don't have the option in New Game Plus to go back to level 1. You start with all your levels and equipment. And the enemies, as far as I can tell, don't scale. Their difficulty is based on the region that they're found in. Which sucks because, you know, after you beat the game, you're very high level. And if you want to experience having a challenge with these same monsters, then you're just out of luck. I really hope that this changes on full release or soon after. If you want to give me one save slot, fine, but you got to give me the option to start over and re-experience what it's like going through the low levels with different vocations. All right, now we got to talk about the quests. The quests are my favorite part of Dragon's Dogma 2. You know, a while ago there was some discussion going on about yellow paint, about signposting in video games, and how developers will use things like yellow paint as a way to show players where to go. Well, the Dragon's Dogma quests are the exact opposite of yellow paint. Quests in Dragon Dogma can be failed. They can be failed in multiple ways, in multiple stages. Their signposting is subtle, and they don't often directly tell you how to get the optimal result. In fact, forget the optimal result. Sometimes it's hard to get any result. There is signposting here. They d there are clues telling you how to do it, but they're subtle. They're camouflaged. Sometimes you know something is a signpost. You know that it's giving you a hint. It's giving you the solution. But you don't know what it is. You, you don't know what it means. It might not be clicking for you, even though you know that that relates to the solution. Let me just give you some examples. I saw this talked about in the promotional material, so you may have heard about this already. There was a side quest where someone's kid went missing, and you're tasked with finding him. But you're not given a map marker. In fact, you're not even given a location. You don't know where the kid is. They just tell you, go find him. Go talk to people around the town. Maybe somebody saw him. And so you talk to people around the town. Some of them stick out to you. And those people will give you some information that will give you hints that will let you intuit how to find the kid. But they're not going to tell you where he is. They're not going to describe where he's at. And this is a timed quest. There will be consequences for not completing this quest quickly. Often, you have to think about what the quest giver actually wants, rather than what they're asking you. Sometimes, giving them what they're asking you to give them is the wrong move. And sometimes, the quest and the quest giver will give you a task, but won't explicitly tell you step by step how to complete it. I saw a interview by people that got to play the game uh, for IGN at one point. They got to play some demo. And they were trying to do a quest that required them to be in a restricted area without getting caught. And one of them failed that quest because he just walked up to the guards. And he did that, he just walked around in the open that way because the quest giver and the quest itself didn't mention that he had to do something to not get caught. And this is just how Dragon's Dogma is. It's not going to tell you things that are a matter of course. It's not going to say something if it's something that you should already know or could reasonably intuit. And very often when you think to yourself, I wonder if that would work? You should probably at least try it, because it might. It often does. The quests have multiple ways of being completed, and you can fail them at various different points. And sometimes you'll complete a quest, but you'll have a vague feeling that something's wrong. You feel like you've been tricked, 
Or one of your pawns might mention that in the world that they came from, they got a better result. And this is one of the great things about pawns. Pawns don't just learn enemy weaknesses, they learn quest details. If a pawn that you have goes to another world and does a quest, it will gain that quest knowledge and will be better able to talk to you about the quest and guide you to certain places. And this is often very useful. There are a lot of quests that I would not have completed optimally if I didn't try and find a pawn that had that quest knowledge. And you can search in the Rift for pawns that specifically have information about the quest that you're doing, which is a resource that I made use of quite often. The quests really are my favorite thing in this game. It's more than just not holding your hand. It's more like, it's more like actively trying to get you to fail and then giving you a dignified nod of approval if you figure it out. It's fantastic. The thrill of figuring something out in a quest for Dragon's Dogma 2 is worth more to me than all the fanfare that you get for quest complete screens in other games. Okay, let's talk about the story in the game. The story for Dragon's Dogma 2 is okay. I don't think it's great. In fact, I don't think it's that good. And there are a lot of ways where even the story of Dragon's Dogma 1 was much better. And I can't help but compare it to the story of Dragon's Dogma 1, because for most of the plot, the story is very similar. There's a reason why I keep comparing it to Dragon's Dogma 1, and that's because it seems to be more like a reimagining of the original concept. And many, many of the same story beats are present here. And I really prefer how those story beats were presented in the first game. That's not to say that I thought the first game's story was all that. It wasn't. In the first game, I didn't like the ending. I didn't think it made sense. I didn't think that its concepts were elaborated on. And some of what it was trying to say was interesting, but I felt it was poorly told. But what it did have was presentation. In the first game, Grigori is one of my favorite depictions of a dragon of any game ever. The voice and the performance of the voice actor were fantastic. And the dialogue itself commands your attention. It draws it in. This cutscene that you're seeing in the background, I watched several times while making this video. I kept getting distracted and letting the whole thing play. But in Dragon's Dogma 2, they kind of hurry you along. The big moments aren't as portentous. The lead-up and confrontation with the dragon, not as impressive. And so, even though overall the story in Dragon's Dogma 2 is more coherent, it has better pacing, and the story of the endgame is more interesting, I still strongly prefer the story of Dragon's Dogma 1, simply because its presentation was stronger. Now that said, I still think that Dragon's Dogma 2 is the better and more enjoyable game. And if you haven't played either, I recommend this one to start with. Overall, I'm very happy with the game. I'm happy that it put its focus on refining the systems it created in Dragon's Dogma 1. Because there's not that many games that use all of them to great effect. It's been 10 years and it's wonderful to see the pawn system back, the freely climbing monsters, and the subtlety of its quests. I expect it will be successful, and I'm hoping that that success will lead to more. I don't want to wait another 10 years for more Dragon's Dogma content. First of all, I'm hoping for a DLC. Something on the scope and quality of Bitter Black Island from Dragon's Dogma 1. I hope the game also comes to its senses and adds a hard mode and a way to let me start over. And if I get all of those things, I'm sure that this is going to end up being one of my favorite games of the year. Anyway, that's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching.